Well, welcome everybody. We are so glad that you're with us, whether you're here in the room with us or joining us online. Really appreciate you joining us for the final weekend of the series that we've been doing the last few weeks called It's Not Fair. And uh, we've shown a few of these video moments, right, that it's easy for us to laugh at, but I'm guessing that in an elevated moment for all of us, we've probably had a situation like one of these that is objectively not that big a deal, but can become a big deal. Uh, And then we all are living in this bigger challenge of the world around us where it just feels like there's a lot going on uh, that's not very fair. And it just feels like, my goodness, when are we gonna get to the other side of that? And so we've talked about a few different interactions that Jesus has had and how actually it shows us uh, that it's a really good thing that it's not fair, that uh, we don't want to get what we deserve, that actually fairness would not help. And so we're going to look at one more of those today. But before we do, I'm going to pray for us. And if you've never been here before, never tuned in online, I pray kneeling. And the reason that I do that is because, man, we have a God that's worth humbling ourselves before. That as much as all this feels bigger than us and out of control, uh, we have a God where nothing is too big for him. Nothing is beyond his reach. And so wherever you are in your faith, wherever you are this morning, would you just pray with me? God, we humble ourselves. We recognize how much bigger you are than us, than our circumstances, than this moment. Would you remind us of that? Whatever feels so all-consuming, God, would you put it in the perspective of you? We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few minutes ago, uh, in the pre-show, they asked you a question. If you weren't here yet, you can go answer it now if you want on Facebook or um, YouTube, Church Online. Even if you're here in the room, there's an Eastern Hills app that has a chat feature you can use. We'd love for you to be able to answer questions throughout the message. Um, And the question that got asked was, when did you not get the credit you deserved. And some of you guys answered that online. Um, Brent said, being an identical twin, I feel like there were many times the twins were congratulated as one. I bet that that feels very sad and probably very true in your life, right? Whether for you it's like class projects, maybe that was something for you. You can think back to you're always the one who did the work and everybody else got the credit. Maybe for you it's a work project or a work idea that somebody else got the credit for, a whole be- bunch of people got the credit that you deserved, you felt like. Maybe for you, you're a student and you feel like you've been working for years in a particular club or sport. And this year, maybe it's your senior year and you're living with all that looking way different than it ever has before, or maybe not even happening at all. If we think about it at like a bigger level, right? We think about the landscape that we're in as a nation right now. And maybe there's a subject or an issue or a candidate or a problem that you feel like isn't getting the credit or the attention it deserves. And so you find yourself frustrated because it just feels like things aren't getting what they deserve, right? When we take a step back and we look at that problem in our own lives, what we're going to look at through this interaction that Jesus has with a couple of his disciples is really what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus who is a leader in our world? Now, I know that the moment I use the word leader, that for some of you, it's just easy for that to be the moment that you tune out, right? Football games have started. And so you're like, I'll just follow my fantasy team for the next few minutes on my phone, no big deal. Or for you, it's just easy to not give yourself any sort of credit that you're a leader, but actually leadership as defined by Jesus is just influence. It just means that you and I can make a difference. It means that you and I can have an impact through our lives. And so no matter where you are, we are all leaders. We all have the opportunity to have influence. And so for some of you, that's influence in a friend group or influence with family members. For some of you, that's influence at work. For some of you, uh, that's influence as an employee or a boss somewhere. And then for some of you, you're influential in your own home as a parent or as a spouse. And what does it look like for you to be influential in the spaces and places that God has given you influence? Well, here's the lesson that Jesus is gonna teach us over the next few minutes together, that we have to surrender credit to gain impact. If we want our life to matter, we wanna, we wanna leave a legacy, we want something different because of our life and the way we've lived it, we have to be less concerned with who gets the credit and more concerned with the impact that God can deliver through our lives if we are less concerned about that credit. Now we're going to step into a scene that Jesus has with a couple of his disciples and their mom. And as we look at that scene, we're going to learn three really important lessons. And the first lesson that we're going to learn is this, that seeking status is dangerous. 
Seeking status is dangerous. It is uh, something that I think lots of us in our time do whether we realize it or not. We look around and we're constantly measuring and comparing like Kendall talked about last week to other people. And we're trying to figure out, is this fair? Is that fair? Am I getting what I deserve? Are they getting what they deserve? But I'm telling you, seeking status is not just neutral. It's not that it just doesn't matter. It's actually toxic as it relates to you and me living out this influence that God has designed us to live out. But as we look at that part of the story, I'd love for you to answer this question wherever you're watching or in the app here in the room. Answer this question. What is a driving condition that scares you? For some of you, you have a really sweet ride and nothing scares you, totally fine. And then for others of you, it's, it's completely on the other end of the spectrum. Maybe for you, it's conditions. Maybe for you, it's a specific situation. Would you share that wherever you're watching today? See, at this point where we step into in Jesus' ministry, he is doing more and more teaching with an authority that nobody's ever heard before. And he's telling them things that they were, like it was just, everything was blowing their mind. In addition to that, the thousands of people that were watching him teach, they were also seeing him do incredible miracles. He was doing healings and, and incredible things that nobody had ever seen before. And so it was obvious at this point in his ministry that things were kind of going up and to the right. And because of that, because of this growing influence, because of this growing audience, there was this big deal that was happening underneath that where basically everybody assumed that the kingdom he was here to establish was an earthly kingdom. You know, if they were maybe willing to concede that Jesus was the Messiah, the sent one, the rescuer, the savior of the world, that what that meant was that he was going to overflow or overthrow the, the earthly kingdom leaders, the governors and uh, people that were in authority over them. And because that wasn't what he was really there for, they asked questions that revealed their confusion. See, Jesus was not here to start an earthly kingdom. He was here to reveal a heavenly kingdom that had no beginning and has no end. But that confusion led to some really interesting questions, not just from people that were listening, but even from his own disciples. And that's what we see right here. Matthew 20 says, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. So this mom of, of these, these two disciples, James and John, this is not James, the half-brother of Jesus. James and John are the sons of Zebedee. They've been walking with Jesus. They've been following him around. And their mom comes up and says, hey, Jesus, here's the thing. We can all tell that this is like a big deal, that things are going really well. Uh, so when you get into your earthly kingdom, when you've set up shop, when we've overthrown the leaders that nobody likes, can my boys sit at your right and left? Like, I'm not here to tell you how to do your job, Jesus. You can pick, but I think James would go really well at your right and John really well at your left. Like she is officially in meddling territory. We've all been kind of devastated in the last couple of years, right? Because we found out that Aunt Becky from Full House did this giant college admission scam, right? This is like the Aunt Becky of 2000 years ago, trying to advocate for her two boys. But actually, what we discover is that in the book of Mark, who also writes about the life and ministry of Jesus, Mark kind of gives us some clues that this was James and John's idea. They put their mom up to it. And the reason for that was because they really wanted the status. They wanted this, this, all this to be worth it. They wanted it to be that down the road when everybody got seen as, okay, they were with him, they were, they were by his side. They wanted to be able to have the status that showed that was the case the whole time. And unfortunately, while we might not ask Jesus to sit at the right and left side of his throne in his kingdom, we are often status seekers also. And we, we don't, like they don't, even understand what they're asking for, right? Because here's what happens. When you and I prioritize status, status sticks and it seeks credit and comfort. Those are its two highest priorities. And so we find, our time, we find ourselves in a time where we are far more interested in looking like we're making a difference than in actually making a difference. And Jesus is going to show us simply how important it is to understand the difference between those two things. I think we're all a little tired, aren't we? That like, it feels like there is this performance activism almost every day on social media. And if you don't do it, you're a terrible person and you have to keep up with it. And it feels like it gets made up all the time. It's like pretty tiring, right? So we all do the things. Now, we all know that makes no difference, right? 
We all know that all that performance and all that stuff that looks the part is not actually doing our part. That the status, well, it may keep you comfortable. Well, the status may make you feel like you're making a difference. Actually making a difference, Jesus is gonna show us, is a lot different than that. And if we prioritize status, it's extremely dangerous. It puts us in a place where we become confused that all of a sudden we think that just looking the part is enough when looking the part actually can be a barrier to making the difference that Jesus wants us to make. I asked you a question a couple minutes ago. Uh, what is a driving condition that scares you? And a few of you guys answered online. Jason said, zero visibility fog. You just don't know what's about to pop out, absolutely. Lucinda said, heavy snowfall, for sure. I'll tell you a story about that in just a second. Mackenzie said, uh, driving through Kansas construction at night. Yeah, that sounds terrible. That sounds really bad. I remember growing up, um, my family lived in Ohio. My sister lived in uh, upstate New York and I would be the one that would often go get her and bring her back for different things. And we were coming back through Pennsylvania and there's a section of the highway where you can't get off. There's no rest stops, there's no pullouts. Like it's just, you're on the road for, for a while. And it was a whiteout blizzard. And I was in a two door front wheel drive, five speed car with my sister. And uh, it was just stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And I remember at one point, the car in front of us stopped faster than I thought. And so I jammed on the brakes and all of a sudden my car does a 180 degree turn. I am facing the wrong way on a highway in a whiteout blizzard with a semi truck coming right for me. And I don't know why I didn't freak out, but I didn't. I put it in first and it started kind of turning the other way. Well, my sister screamed louder than I'd ever heard before and left permanent damage to my arm, right? Like that was the scene. And if you've ever had an experience like that, in a car, you have that same experience that comes back to you in that moment, don't you? When the road conditions get to those kinds of conditions, all of a sudden, it's not just, I need to be careful. It's like, I know why I need to be careful. I've lived through this before, right? And the thing is, well, we understand that about road conditions. We understand that about different areas of our life, how dangerous those things can be, that we need to bring a level of caution to them. Unfortunately, this area of status, we don't bring it appropriate caution. We don't think about that problem and go, you know what, God, I need, to, I need to be careful that it's not about credit seeking here. It's not about status seeking here. It's not about looking the part. It's actually about doing my part. It's not about God, what can you do for me today? It's, it's God, what can I give away today? How can I make a difference today? Because like we've already said, we have to surrender credit to gain impact. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they didn't know this yet, but Jesus was about to show them. The second lesson that he teaches them that we can learn with them today is that obedience is painful. Obedience is painful. Now, one of the things we say around here all the time is that when God says do, he means he designed you that way. And when he says don't, he means don't hurt yourself. And we don't follow God and obey this law of love that Jesus establishes for the sake of him loving us. No, no, no. We are obedient to this new law of love in Jesus because God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for you and me. We respond to the love and grace that he freely gives to us. And that obedience of what it means to love and lead well in our lives, sometimes it hurts. We say around here that Jesus makes life better. We believe that. It doesn't mean that life always gets easier. It means that no matter how difficult life is, it's better when it's with Jesus. And he's about to show these two disciples that very idea. But before we learn it together, would you answer this question for me? Wherever you're watching, what's the biggest medical procedure you've ever had? For some of you, it's like a really, really big thing. Somebody last night said brain surgery. I was like, that's a really big deal. It's a big one. Uh, for some of you, if you were like, I had a doctor help me with a hangnail, probably just stay out of the chat. But like anything above that, just drop it in. We'd love to see some of that. Now, where we jump to in the passage, Jesus has just heard the question and now he's responding um, not just to their mom, but he's responding to James and John directly. It says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And this is where James and John chime in. They said, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. See, Jesus is trying to help the mom and James and John to see that they don't truly understand what they're asking for. See, 
he, he's trying to help them understand it's not just about let's get through the next couple months, let's continue to build support, then we'll have a political party together, then a bunch of people will vote for us, then we'll get this amazing level of leadership and you guys can be in my cabinet. That's not, that's not what Jesus has in mind because again, his kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. His kingdom is kingdom of heaven. He's not establishing it, he's revealing it. It's a kingdom that has no beginning and has no end. And so the way he explains that is he asks them like, hey, do you really think you can drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Now for us, that seems maybe like strange language. We don't totally know what he means, but for them in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Jewish mind, this was a very understood metaphor that was about suffering. That to drink a cup like this meant that you were gonna suffer for whatever it was that was on the other side. And for James and John, I mean, to their credit, at least at the moment, they were like, okay, Jesus, we are absolutely ready. We are absolutely capable to drink the cup you're talking about. But they didn't understand the cup that Jesus meant. And so he doesn't go like, oh, I bet you can. He just says, well, you're gonna, you're definitely gonna drink from this cup. The thing that they didn't know Jesus was talking about is that the cup of suffering would ultimately one day bring both of them to the point where they would be martyred. They would lose their life for this movement in the first century. And he says, so you're gonna, you're gonna drink from the cup of suffering of what it means to follow me. But in addition to that, this idea of who sits where, like the seating arrangement in the kingdom of heaven is not established by me. It's established by my heavenly father. And all of a sudden they're like, wait, what is, wait, what? Because to them, they're still thinking that Jesus is gonna be the earthly king in a new kingdom in their lifetime. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you don't, you don't understand. The kingdom is right now. I'm not waiting for it to start. I'm in it right now. The kingdom of heaven has never stopped and it never will. And the seating arrangement in that kingdom is established by my heavenly father. And who sits in my right and my left, not up to me, and it won't be you. See, he shows how this works, right? He shows them that it's bigger than they could possibly imagine. And he shows them that what it looks like, even not to get the credit they want, but to have the impact that God could have through them, it was gonna hurt. There was gonna be suffering with it. They might've thought that was gonna be the religious people continue to not like them. They had some friends that walked away and Jesus was trying to just start helping them understand and oh, it's gonna be way more difficult than that. But the problem is we get blinded, don't we? We get blinded because when we prioritize status and comfort, we rationalize disobedience and delayed obedience. When we decide that status and comfort are the things that are, we are primarily seeking, here's what takes place. We decide what it means to be successful. And so because of that, we start coloring outside the lines and cutting corners and all of a sudden, God must have me wanna be with that person. God must have me wanna have that job or live in that house or drive that car or make that amount of money. And, it, and if, I have to, if I have to do some things that I know don't really go in line with the law that God has for me, the law of loving Jesus, of what it means to love God with everything I have and to love my neighbor as myself, even if it means I gotta just skirt a little bit of that here or there, God, when I get all that stuff, just imagine how much you could do through my life when I get to all that stuff. But here's the problem. If the stuff that you have and the place that you wanna get, you have to lie to get there, you'll have to lie to stay there. And if, if comfort and status, if those are your priorities, they're intoxicating, they stick to you. You can't give those up. You just have to have more. See, you become the exception to the rule the exception to the guidelines, you get to be special. And when you're the exception to the rule, you always break the rules, don't you? You always become the person that, you give yourself all the benefit of the doubt at the motivation level and you judge everybody around you based on what you see. So I'm just encouraging you to think differently about what obedience looks like, that the kind of impact God wants you and me to have is huge, but it means you might not get the credit. And if you're more interested, and being seen as making a difference than actually making a difference, you will continue to live a life that makes little to no difference and you will be disappointed even in all that you have. I asked you this question earlier, what's the biggest medical procedure you've ever had? Some of you guys answered online. Ashley said a double mastectomy. Wow, Tracy said trauma surgery to stop bleeding out. Wow. And then my son Greer swallowing a quarter. Yeah, that... <laughs> I remember that, yep. You know, all of us, if we've ever had surgery or ever had to deal with a surgeon or doctor and had to have some major medical procedure, we're so thankful that a doctor uses a scalpel, aren't we? 
Because when a doctor uses a scalpel, what that means is they're being precise. They know exactly where they need to deal with in our body to take care of whatever's wrong with us. None of us would say, you know what, doc, if you could set that scalpel down and pick up a sledgehammer instead, that'd be really helpful. Because we know that the sledgehammer is gonna do more damage. But here's the problem. When you and I prioritize status and credit and entitlement, rather than real impact, rather than letting God in, we build a wall around ourselves. Oftentimes we build a wall around our heart and God who would much rather use a scalpel to work in the areas of motivation and priority and those, those disconnected areas of your life, he has to use a sledgehammer to get through. And oftentimes the sledgehammer is a sledgehammer of suffering. It's a sledgehammer of pain. And so for some of you this year, you've faced that financially. You've faced that in an area related to something that maybe we're all going through or something you're specifically going through. And so the question isn't, can God use it? It's, will you let him use it? Will you let him speak to you through that? Or will it always be a sprint back to who gets credit? Because in your life, if you really wanna make a difference, if you really want your life to matter, it's when you surrender credit that you can gain impact. So I don't know for you where this shows up in your life, but seeking status, that's dangerous. Obedience is painful. And what we're about to learn is the third lesson Jesus teaches in this story, which is authority is an influence, especially formal authority, authority that has a name tag with it, authority that gets a business card. That kind of authority isn't the same thing as influence. And he's not just teaching James and John and their mom anymore. He's gonna be teaching all of his disciples because the word has spread. As a matter of fact, when we kind of dive into this part of the story, we find out that the other 10 hear about it. It says, when the 10 heard it, they were indignant, right? They were furious at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus is now hearing from the other 10 and what the other 10 are not saying is, hey, James and John, I don't think you guys get it. Jesus is not here to establish a heavenly or establish an earthly kingdom. We don't need to figure out the seating assignment. It's not about who gets credit. It's not about who's seen as successful or who has the right status. Like you guys don't understand. It's about prioritizing service and the right kind of attitude to make a difference over all that. No, no, no. What they're saying is like, hey, Jesus, if there was like a meeting about seating assignments in the kingdom, I feel like we should have been at the meeting, Jesus. Is there like a raffle? Is there a point system? Like, how do we get into this conversation? (laughs) And the reason we know that is because what Jesus says next, Jesus goes, no, 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 guys. Like, it doesn't work that way. And he's like, I get it. I understand why you think it does. I see the way your leaders treat you. I see the way they use their formal authority to lord that authority over you in a way that's unkind. You know, he uses this phrase, he says, I see how the Gentiles lord it over you, how their great ones kind of hold it over your head. And for us, we don't really think about this divide between Jews and Gentiles, the way that Jesus was talking about in the first century. But some of you would need to hear Jesus tell you, hey, I hear, I understand why you think about leadership this way. And I see how the Democrats lord it over you. For others of you, you would need to hear Jesus say, hey, I understand why you think leadership looks like this. And I see the way the Republicans lord it over you. I see the way leaders in business and the world around you lord it over you. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's different than that. And what it means for you to be great, if you wanna be great, you become a servant. If you wanna be first, you become a slave. You figure out how to put other people first. That's the change here. But just like Kendall talked about last week, we get in trouble when how we show up and how we want our life to make a difference gets into the world of comparison. Because you wanna be a leader that maybe has what another leader you've seen has had. You get to have the influence that they had, you get to have the car that they had, you get to have the voice that they had. But don't compare, don't go, I'm I'm a little better than they were, I'm not as bad as they were. No, 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 like Jesus says it's a completely different paradigm. Jesus goes on and he says, look, look, 
Instead of this kingdom being about you getting more, it's about you giving more. He actually goes on to say this. He says, this is actually the way it works even with the son of man. He's describing himself. He says, the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to be a ransom for many. And I'm sure, I'm sure that the disciples are hearing this and they're like, that's an interesting metaphor, Jesus. What do you mean? And Jesus is like, not a metaphor. I'm going to die for you. I'm gonna lay my life down. If the God of the universe did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for you and me, how crazy is it when you and I assume that somehow, some way it would work different today with you and me, that all of a sudden now it's about getting more rather than giving more, even though Jesus said that is the opposite of what he has in mind. See, the problem with status and success and credit and all that stuff is that it leads to entitlement. And entitlement says that you and I are special, that we're different, that we get to do it our own way. And entitlement is a dangerous byproduct of confusing authority and influence. Maybe you do have a title. Maybe you do have a business card. Maybe somebody does look up to you. But if you misconstrue that as real influence, as really making a difference in their life, that's when entitlement grows. That's when you think you get to do it different. That's when all the perks show up. That's why, that's why we get into so much trouble. But the ladder of leadership with Jesus is not a ladder that goes up. It's a ladder that goes down to the level of people, to the level of service. It's not about creating distance between you and those who you serve. It's about being close to people. You know, so for some of you, maybe that's in the marketplace. For some of you, that's at home or at school. For some of you, that's in a neighborhood. What does it look like for you to say, you know what, it's a ladder of leadership that goes down with Jesus, not a ladder of leadership that separates from me from people and puts me on another level. I've heard it put this way, that if you're married or maybe you're thinking about getting married, uh, that the way this works is, it's like there is a line in your marriage and what it means to do this is it's a race to the back of the line in your marriage. That what you're constantly trying to do is serve one another and care for one another. The apostle Paul describes this as outdoing one another and showing honor. And that if we'll do this in key relationships, especially in our marriage, maybe you've never seen it done before. Maybe it's not what you saw in your parents. Maybe it's not what you see in your life. It can be different through your life. What does it look like to be the person that sacrificially serves, that doesn't keep score? Because if we'll do that for one another, even though we look around and we're so frustrated by so many things that are happening in our world, your world can be different. You can make a difference in your home. You can make a difference in the workplace. You can make a difference at your school. I know that for some of you, you're not a Christian maybe, you're, you're watching because somebody shared this with you or you're watching because somebody brought you here. I'm glad you're watching, I'm glad you're here. And for some of you, what I'm describing feels so different than what you've heard Christianity is really all about before. For you, it's been exactly all the things I've described it as not being. It's been about people that feel separate. It's been about people that create distance. It's about people that feel like they're better than you. And unfortunately, as the church around the world, we're still catching up 2000 years later to the kind of teaching that Jesus told us to live and lead with in our lives. But my guess is you see the value in this kind of leadership in the kind of leadership that prioritizes service over status. And that kind of leadership came directly from Jesus. The problem for so many of us though, is that we're stuck, right? We just feel it. We feel this gridlock inside of us. When I was in college, I went uh, to a school in downtown Chicago. And I remember the first, um, the first time I was driving around during the day, especially between like three and seven on weekdays, uh, it was just a parking lot when you're on highways. And the, the first few times that you do it, you're like so frustrated about it, trying to find out the reason why it's happening. And if somebody from Chicago is with you, you'll say something like, man, who is the moron that is parked on the highway somewhere up here? Like, can't they just get out of the way? Like, just push them. Who, how do we do this? And then you discover like, well, there are accidents in Chicago, like anywhere. It's actually different in Chicago in some respects because of the way the highways are built. Um, it doesn't take an accident to create that problem. It just takes people at the front of the line slowing down a little bit. And it creates this chain reaction where by the end of the line, wherever you are, it's a parking lot. And I know that everybody in Denver thinks that our traffic is really bad. It's not great, but trust me, it's not that bad yet. And the thing is like, that's annoying when you're driving, but I think we all feel that same kind of gridlock in our world, don't we? There are really big problems that we're trying to face. 
And from where I sit, we're being pitted against one another. And you have leaders and politicians that basically have decided if I can just slow down a little bit, because if my idea can't be the idea and I can't get all the credit for it and all the power from it, I'd rather go to my corner and do nothing than be a part of a better solution. And so we have people that are doing this over and over and over again on every political side and we're just left holding the bag. And maybe you're experiencing that at work. Maybe you're experiencing that at school. I think we're all experiencing it to a certain extent around the world right now, but we can be different. Jesus did this in the first century. He began a movement of people that prioritized service over status, of people that would let their comfort go for the sake of impact to the world around them. We can do it again. Because as much as all that's frustrating around us, what we get to control is us. And so what is it in your life that needs to change? Where does the gridlock need to adjust? How can you make a difference and not just be seen <laughs> as someone who wants to make a difference? And the area that I want you to think about is at a personal level, where are some of those areas and relationships in your life that are in gridlock too? And maybe it's because, maybe it's because you're just not willing to own your part of it. Maybe it's that this problem has always been somebody else's. And maybe you've never heard this before. Maybe this is new information. Maybe you're just hearing it for the first time in a long time, but no problem is ever entirely one person's fault. You always have something you can own. And it might feel like the piece of the pie that you can own is pretty small. But if you really wanna break up the gridlock in relationships in your life, it starts with you being willing to genuinely own the piece that you can own. Will you? Will you take a step back and, and really let that happen? Or will it always be somebody else's fault? Will it always be somebody else's problem? Because that kind of status seeking, that kind of, I need to protect me, my comfort, my position, that's an exhausting way to live. I'd love for you this week to be thinking about and maybe asking yourself this question in lots of different spheres. Where are you seeking credit over impact? Maybe there's a specific thing right now you can think of, right as I say it, that you need to let go. You say, God, I don't care who gets the credit for this. I just wanna be about seeing your kingdom revealed. I just wanna be about seeing progress made. I think there's something so much better than you and me chasing status and chasing credit and chasing the appearance of making a difference. Well, nothing really changes. It might not seem fair that you don't get credit, but it's better because the impact on the other side not only protects your heart from the pride that would come maybe from you getting that credit, but it lets the momentum of this servant leadership that God established 2000 years ago continue through your life. Can I pray for you? God, I pray for every single person here. I pray for every person watching online that wherever God, we need to take inventory in our lives, in our relationships, in our connection with you, that we would. And God, there are so many different challenges that we feel today. And God, I believe that for so many of us, we can actually be a part of making a difference if we'll simply surrender it to you. I pray that we would. I pray God that even, even today, you would speak to us you would challenge us. You would point us back to the kind of difference you want our lives to make. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.